Part 1 You will hear a teenager inquiring about joining a photography competition. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. This is Photo Club magazine. How can I help you? I'm calling about the photography competition. I was wondering if entries have closed yet. No, not yet. Closing date for entries is March the 5th. So you have a few weeks yet. Great. I'd really like to enter. Do you have any other questions about the competition? Well, I hear it's for young photographers under the age of 21. Is that correct? Not quite. There are two parts of the competition. The junior section is for people under 21, and the adult section is for people aged 21 and up. How old are you? I'm 19, so I'd qualify for the junior photographers section. I couldn't find where on your website I can submit my photograph, it does mention the competition, but it only seems to have a postal address. That's because it is an analogue competition. We have held the competition for the last 50 years, and when digital cameras came on the scene, they were never included in the competition. We accept photographs that are taken on 35mm film or larger. They also have to be developed by the photographer in a darkroom. The competition is not just judging the photography, but also the photographer's competence in developing the photo. But what if you want to submit a colour photo? That would have to be sent to a lab, wouldn't it? Not many people have the capability of developing colour photos at home. The competition is only for black and white images. They can be of any size, but the minimum is 10 by 8 inches, which is about 25 by 20 centimetres. That's a bit smaller than an A4 size piece of paper, and it's a traditional size for photographic paper. So, how do I submit the photo? You need to cut out the application form that is published in the magazine. You can buy the magazine at newsagents. You have to send it by post or courier, with your photo to the address of our offices. You said you saw the address. The one on the website, 55 Military Road, Islington? Yes, that's right. I suggest you read the conditions of the competition as well. For example, the photographs become the property of Photo Club magazine and they will not be returned to the photographer. You still retain copyright of the image, but the physical photo will belong to us and goes into our collection. So, if you wanted to publish it, you would have to pay me, right? For articles on the competition, no. But if we wanted to use it for another purpose, we would have to get your permission and arrange a fee. That sounds OK. Can the photographs be of any subject this year? Yes, the theme of this year's competition is New Beginnings, so the photograph needs to be related to that theme. I think I already know the photo I'm going to enter then. I took a great shot of a baby deer in the forest last year. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Is there a prize for the competition? Yes, the prize is provided by the company Jackson Film. It is £500 for the junior section and £1,000 for the adult section. Who judges the competition? 
Well, the 20 best photographs in each section are selected by Danny Montgomery, the famous landscape photographer. All the shortlisted images are published in our May issue. The readers of the magazines are the ones who decide the final two winners. Do they vote through the post too? No, the voting is done online. Readers go onto the website and select the name of the photographer whose work they like best. We get thousands of votes every year. Who was the junior photographer winner last year? The prize went to a 16-year-old photographer from Japan. I can't remember her name offhand, but she submitted a photograph of her mother reading. It was quite beautiful. Oh yes, I think I saw that on the website. Does it cost anything to enter? For most photographic competitions, it costs about £10. We don't charge people to enter the competition, so it's free, but you can only submit one photograph. You have to decide which one you think is best. Thank you very much for the information. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking at a graffiti cleanup day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to today's graffiti cleaning day. It's marvellous to see you all here and up so early to clean Monterey Street. We have decided to tackle the city's graffiti problem street by street every weekend. So we are starting with Monterey Street today as it is the main street of this town and the one that people see the most as well as the hundreds of adults and children who are here today as volunteers, we also have among you about 20 convicted graffiti offenders who are spending a court-set number of hours cleaning off graffiti as part of their punishment. We are not going to point out who these people are, but we do hope that when they experience the amount of labour it takes to remove this vandalism, they may think twice about doing it again. I also hope that you are inspired by the hundreds of other citizens here who are tired of seeing graffiti on their streets and are willing to spend their free time doing something about it. I see many of you are wearing protective clothing and gloves. Those who do not have these can get them when they are at the registration desk. These have been provided by the local council with the help of Marksons, who are manufacturers of uniforms who have kindly donated gloves and protective smocks to this cause. Make sure you remember to return them at the end of the day so they can be cleaned and reused next week. We hope to work all day during the hours of daylight though you do not have to give us the whole day if you are not able to. Everyone is welcome to spend as much time as they can helping us here today, with the exception of the people who are here by command of the court. These people will need to log in the number of hours worked today and are not permitted to leave early unless they have written permission from their parole officer. We will be breaking up into work groups of 20 people and each group will be managed by a technical leader. You are required to follow your technical leader's instructions to the letter. Some groups will be doing wall washing, others will follow with painting. There are a couple of groups that will be working on other surfaces such as metal and glass which require special cleaning equipment and face masks. Families with younger children will be assigned to the washing groups. 
individuals and families with older teenagers will be on painting duty. We ask that no one is to climb ladders today. This is the job of group technical leaders and council staff who are covered by insurance in case they fall. If we have any accidents today, we have first aid on standby next to the registration desk. If anything occurs, tell your supervisor immediately and they will make sure you get the appropriate care. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Though we are looking at a day that will be filled with hard work, we are glad to see that the weather is on our side and we will most likely have clear skies all day and a temperature of about 25 degrees. As you can see, the street has been closed off for the entire day, so we don't have any traffic danger. We will take a break for lunch at 1 o'clock and food will be served at picnic tables that are now being temporarily erected in the middle of the street. Drinks facilities have already been set up where you can get bottled water, tea and coffee and soft drinks and that you will have access to all day. It is important to keep hydrated while doing work like this and if anyone is feeling tired at some stage, we ask you to take a break and go and sit at the picnic tables. We know that different age groups and fitness levels mean that some people will be able to take on more work than others. We want to thank everyone who has come today and any amount of help that you can give is gratefully accepted. We ask that if you haven't done registration yet, do so now and we expect to start briefing the groups and starting work in the next 20 minutes. Again, thank you for giving us your time and effort. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear two students, Andrew and Isabel, telling their tutor a project that they are doing together on bacterial contamination of kitchens on the university campus. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Andrew and Isabel. Have you decided what kind of testing you are going to do for your research protocol study project? Yes, we want to look at food preparation sites on campus. We are going to swab working surfaces in kitchens to measure the levels of bacteria. What made you decide on this? There have been a few cases of food poisoning on campus lately though the source has not been clearly identified. We don't necessarily want to blame any particular kitchen, but we would like to set up a kind of standard test for monitoring bacterial levels. Have you decided which kitchens to test? It's a sensitive issue. It's not like we can just go into kitchens and start taking swabs. We have to get permission from a few areas. Firstly, we have to get it from you before we can take our requests to other bodies. The idea we have is to test 10 kitchens on campus. 
We want to test five self-service canteens, three college dining rooms and two sandwich bars. How did you decide on this configuration? We based it on a study that was done last year on how students who purchase lunch on campus, about 60% of students either bring their own lunch with them, buy lunch off campus in a cafe or supermarket, or do not eat lunch at all. Only about 40% of the student population that were surveyed buy their lunch on campus. Approximately half of students who buy their lunch on campus eat in one of the self-service canteens, the ones where students line up and select their food that is then served onto plates by staff. Students then take the plate away on a tray. A third eat in their college dining rooms where the students are served the same meal while seated at a table. About 20% buy from sandwich bars, where sandwiches are made to order in front of students. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. You mentioned getting permission from me to do the study. If I grant it to you, who else needs to OK the project? We need to get the green light from Professor Harding, the lecturer for the Research Practices Protocols course. Then we have to approach the Director of University Services, then, I imagine, we would need to get permission from the managers of each of the kitchens we would like to test. That's a long chain of people. Give me the protocol form to sign so you can get moving on getting the rest of the permissions. But first, you have to tell me how you intend to test each of these kitchens. Andrew? We'll do swabs in three different areas of the kitchen. On the main preparation surface, in a sink where food is washed, and from a surface in a wet food storage area. Then we would swab a neutral area in each kitchen as a control. This would be a total of 40 swabs over the course of the testing. It sounds expensive. How are you going to cover the laboratory fees? We are going to use the university labs for testing and not send out the swabs to a private testing firm. We are going to do most of the labour ourselves, so costs will be lower. Are you concerned that this will interfere with the blindness of the testing? If you do the collection of samples and do the testing, this could compromise the impartiality of the results. Yes, we know it's not ideal, but we had to compromise. If we have clear indications of patterns in the presence of bacteria, we hope the tests could be redone under more impartial circumstances. So, do you have any expectations from the testing before you begin it? What will your hypothesis be? We do expect to find similar bacteria in the same areas of different kitchens. For example, we imagine that there will be salmonella found in washcloths in the sinks. Other bacteria we will be particularly looking out for are E. coli, Shigella, Campylobacter and Hepatitis A. We believe that we may find examples of all these in the main food preparation areas. Are you going to ask each kitchen about their hand washing and cleaning protocols? This is more difficult to monitor. All of the kitchens are obliged to follow the university's standards for this, which are in a document called Food Hygiene Protocols, published by University Services about 10 years ago. But whether this is being followed is difficult to know. We can only ask. I am very happy with the way this testing has been planned so far. Now, you need to start getting the other permissions to start your testing. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. You will hear a part of a lecture about domesticated animals. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Of more than 8 million species of animals on Earth, only a very small number of them have been able to be domesticated. These are most notably the cow, goat, sheep, chicken, horse, pig, dog and cat, and they are now widespread across the globe. Why? how and when certain animals became domesticated has intrigued scientists for years. Mitochondrial DNA analysis has now brought us closer to answering some of these questions. Dogs were domesticated from wolves over 14,000 years ago and selective breeding has made them physically distinguishable from wolves whose heads continue to grow throughout life while dogs do not. Cats are thought to have been first domesticated around 7500 BC in Cyprus and have historically been used for controlling mice and rat infestations. Cats may have first encountered humans after they were drawn to rodent infested areas where humans lived. Cats and dogs are quite unique among domesticated animals as they have rarely been used as a food source. The study of the origin of different domesticated animals is a good way to trace the beginnings of the farming economy. For example, the first animals to be domesticated were herding animals such as sheep and goats about 10,000 years ago. These animals were suited to a nomadic lifestyle and used for their meat, milk and coats. They were an integral part of nomadic communities. Nomads began moving in search of grasslands for their domestic animals, rather than in search of wild animals to kill. Killing wild animals was less reliable and much more dangerous. Pigs, cattle and chickens were domesticated shortly afterwards and were indicators of more settled communities as they were more difficult animals to move around. Horses were originally domesticated for food 5,000 years ago and came to be used as a form of transport around 2,000 years later. Scientists have pinpointed quite exact timing for the domestication of milk-bearing animals as it is when humans in those areas developed mutations for lactose tolerance. Being able to stay in one place and still be able to support large populations with a reliable, high-energy food source allowed civilizations to emerge. How is domestication defined? Lists of criteria have been suggested, but it is virtually impossible for all animals that are considered domesticated to fall into all of these and for cats in particular, to be in any of them. One of these is that a domestic animal recognizes that it is part of a social hierarchy and is subordinate to their human leader. This might be true of very intelligent domestic animals, such as dogs and horses. Even then, a dog or horse can often consider itself at the top of the hierarchy and it may require special training to change this. Domesticated animals that are herd animals in their wild state do not follow instructions from their human leader, but are moved around using methods that involve fear and control. They are guided through gates and onto trucks with dogs and loud noises and the tendency to follow the other members in their group, which is the flocking instinct. Another suggestion 
is that a domesticated animal now needs man to survive and would not last very long in the wild. This can be quite quickly dismissed when you think of the success of feral cats and pigs. Perhaps these and other concepts could be better managed if we consider domestic animals to be in a number of classes, such as house animals, working animals, and animals for food. But this would only mean that domesticity is not an overreaching concept. So, is there a definition of domestication? These days, genes have come to our rescue. A domesticated animal is one that has undergone genetic modification through selective breeding, so that it has become useful for man. Using this definition, domestic animals do not need to be tame, or able to take orders, or be vulnerable in the wild. They merely require genetic changes that distinguish them from their wild equivalents. This is why an elephant is not considered domesticated, or a tame fox, as they have not changed genetically. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I'm